to be able to um, introduce our ecumenical guest this afternoon. The first time I met Alison Barnett Cowan was in the crypt under St. Martin in the Fields Church in London. She was at work and my husband and I were on holiday in England. At that time, Alison was serving as the director for unity, faith and order for the Anglican communion around the world. In that capacity, she was the lead staff person for the ecumenical dialogues of the Anglican communion around the world, including conversations with the Roman Catholic Church, the Orthodox Churches, the Lutheran World Federation, the Methodist World Council, and the World Communion of Reformed Churches. Although Allison has worked brilliantly on the international level of ecumenical relations between the churches, including serving as a member of the Faith and Order Commission of the World Council of Churches, we are proud to say that she is a Canadian. At one time, she was the director of the Faith, Worship and Ministry Department of the Anglican Church of Canada, where she staffed its theological and ecumenical work. Today she serves as the President of the Canadian Council of Churches, a forum of 25 member denominations representing 85% of Christians in Canada. I have personally benefited from Allison's teaching in ecumenism when we invited her to be a keynote speaker for the Summer Ecumenical Institute in Saskatoon back in 2011. This summer she will be back in my city teaching in our program in ecumenical studies and formation, together with the Reverend Dr. Michael Kinneman, another renowned ecumenist from the United States. Allison is a graduate of Trinity College at the University of Toronto and has been awarded honorary doctorates by several other theological colleges. Please join me in welcoming Canon Dr. Allison Barnett Cowan. Moderator, uh, members of the Assembly, staff, and fellow guests. I am delighted to be able to bring you greetings and thanks on behalf of the Canadian Council of Churches. Thanks because your own Clerk of Assembly, Stephen Kendall, gives much time that he probably doesn't really have to serve as one of the three Vice Presidents of the Canadian Council of Churches. As President, I'm personally very indebted to Stephen for his wisdom and experience as a church leader. Thanks are also due to all those Presbyterians who serve on the commissions, committees and working groups of the Council. If you serve or have served on anything relating to the Canadian Council of Churches, would you please wave your hand? Okay, thank you Stephen, thank you. And there are many more who have in the past. There are, among the member churches of the Council, six Orthodox churches, seven that would describe themselves as Evangelical with a capital E, and all the so-called mainline denominations. Your church, of course, is a founding member. The Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops is a full member, and it was one of the first Roman Catholic conferences in the world to join an ecumenical council of churches. One of the reasons that our council works as well as it does is that several years ago it decided to work in a forum model. That means that all decisions, except for legal and financial ones, are made by consensus and not by resolution. This honors the several operating ecclesiologies which are represented by our member churches. The governing board, which is made up of one to three representatives of the member churches, including Amanda Curry, um, cannot operate by majority vote because some of the participants are simply not authorized to speak for their church, while others can. Sometimes in the course of a meeting, members will have to phone check back with their own denominations even before they'll agree to something by consensus. But this doesn't mean that the Canadian Council of Churches is uh, without power. It doesn't mean it can't make statements, either in a form of a pastoral letter to the church people of the churches as we did last November in the early days of the refugee crisis, or as a letter to the Prime Minister or to one of the other ministers of the Crown. 
As president, I can only write a letter if it has been agreed to by all the churches. Uh, we have to work by silence means consent after a certain deadline and we never get anything done. But it can take quite a time to check back with all the churches. The general secretary can write from a sense of the meeting and the two commissions can write in their own name as the Commission on Faith and Witness just recently did on the question of equal access to palliative care. The Council functions through two commissions, Faith and Witness, as I've just mentioned, and Justice and Peace. There are also various working groups or subcommittees, including Emergency Preparedness, the Anti-Racism Network, Sexual Exploitation, which was formerly called Human Trafficking, the Week of Prayer Editorial Group, Project Plowshares. The Council is also the platform through which Canadian Christians engage in interfaith relations and dialogue. Just this last week, I was with an agency of the Canadian Council of Churches when I was with the military chaplains in Cornwall, uh, ably represented uh, by you, by Jean Morris, and she brought an American colleague from, who is the, a woman who is the head of the Navy chaplaincy for the United States, um, also a Presbyterian. As president, I have undertaken in my course of my three-year uh, uh, reign, uh, it's a, it's a three-year voluntary position, um, and I am a living example of what really happens when you retire. You just work as hard, only at different things. Um, but I've undertaken to visit the leadership of all the member churches during my time in office, and so far I have completed nine of these. They have been very interesting and engaging, and it's interesting to see how churches construct the visits. Uh, with the Ukrainian Catholics and the Ukrainian Orthodox and the Greek Orthodox, I met with the Metropolitan, the head guy. Um, with the United Church, and interestingly with the Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops, I met a broad range of, of their senior leadership. Um, it's also interesting um, things that I've been given. It's a wonderful testimony to the Canadian identity of our churches that when I visited the United Church, I was served baklava, and when I visited the Ukrainian Orthodox, I was given Timbits. <laughs> <laughs> Most of our conversations have been about how to improve the work of the Canadian Council of Churches. All of the, all of the churches I've visited say they completely endorse its work. They wouldn't be able to function well without it. But there are a couple of concerns. One is that the council is too Toronto-centric. Uh, I first met church leaders in Winnipeg, and they were quite happy to tell me that. And it's true. Um, our office is here in Toronto. And um, as with many other things, unfortunately, in Canadian society, you kind of end up doing things where your staff are because of costs as much as anything. And it disadvantages some small churches because of the cost of travel for representatives. We have, a, we have heard a really strong need for the council to engage with ecumenical agencies uh, at the local and regional level. And we have really wanted to do this. We'd love to get lists of ministerials. Um, the problem is that ministerial leadership often changes every year. And so by the time you got a list, you found out that it was the Salvation Army guy who was in charge last year. And you don't know who the person is who's going to be the leader of the ministerial this year. But we know that there are many ways that we could improve our connections with the local level. I would love to see every church bulletin board, every church sign, have the logo of the Canadian Council of Churches on it. And then people would see the 85% of Christians who actually belong to the Canadian Council of Churches. It doesn't take much to tack it on to the bottom of your sign. My second commitment as president was to promote Christian engagement with the calls to action of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission especially among member churches which did not have an historical relationship with First Nations peoples through the residential schools. And I found it very encouraging in my visits with the Christian Reformed and with the Salvation Army and with the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Canada that they're very committed to educating their people on this call to all Canadians. For example, they have all, all those churches have used or are about to use the blanket exercise with their senior leadership. And I'm looking forward to hearing how, how that went for the Christian Reformed because they're the Christian Reformed Church in North America and they did the blanket exercise uh, in Grand Rapids, Michigan. They've undertaken education programs for their congregations and have set up twinning relationship between settlers and First Nations. And one of the churches had a cross-country tour of, uh, in their churches of Aboriginal art. 
all fairly simple ideas, but ways of, of promoting truth and reconciliation. Just two weeks ago, the governing board of the council met in Ottawa, as it does every spring. And as part of our meeting, we, were, we attended the national prayer breakfast and also had meetings in small groups with members of parliament. Each year in our delegations to the Hill, we choose topics which we want to discuss with members, and we ask the leaders of all the parties to arrange meetings with an appropriate person. Usually this is a minister or their policy advisor um, or an opposition critic, or in the case of the Greens, actually, it's always with their leader. This year, the topics we chose were palliative care and doctor-assisted death, truth and reconciliation with Indigenous peoples, and the role of faith communities in public life. I just want to share one little snippet from the National Prayer Breakfast. Um, it was my first experience of such a gathering, and we got up very early to get there. And the speaker was a very interesting man. He was the great nephew of Lord Beaverbrook, and he'd served for 26 years as a parliamentarian in the House of Parliament in London, in England. Um, for reasons that weren't fully disclosed, he was um, imprisoned for 18 months for perjury. And he spoke about his experience of praying with Paddy the Irish thief in prison and forming a, a small cell group there. And uh, then he talked about the temptations of power, the temptations for people and leaders when they have, uh, when they're victorious and when they are defeated. And there are temptations at every level. And of the need for leaders not just to say sorry, but to have true metanoia and repentance and a change of heart. What was particularly poignant about this was that be sitting beside him on the day after his little exhibition in Parliament was the Prime Minister. And he was looking very sober indeed as he was exhorted by this man at this meeting. Well, as, as you wrestle with difficult questions of scripture and culture, of how best to bring Christian values to an increasingly secular society, and how to be faithful in the midst of change, I commend to you the method of careful listening across difference which the Canadian Council of Churches is learning to practice. And I am sure that you are already engaging in that spirit-led process, and you all be in my prayers in the days ahead. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. As you are a blessing to the Canadian Council of Churches, you are a blessing to us as well. We very much are, are grateful that you've taken the time to be here and to share these words. And a good reminder, these little things to put on our bulletin boards, are they uh, downloadable or order we better orderable? Do we better do that. That's right. Uh, but we look forward to doing so. A small indication of our appreciation from our local arrangements committee. You are always welcome among us. Thank you. Thank you.